Good morning. Thank you for joining us for our time of worship uh, on this weekend at Crossroads Community Baptist Church. Uh, we hope that uh, wherever you're at joining us in worship this morning, that you are uh, ready to praise God and to get into His Word. Uh, we trust that you're comfortable wherever you're at, but we don't want you to be too comfortable. And so uh, if you uh, want to stand up while you sing, feel free to do so wherever you're at. Uh, but this is a wonderful time to come and to sing praises to our God uh, and to acknowledge Him as our Savior. And so join us, won't you, this morning as we worship Him. Whether online, alone in our home, or gathered together in a church building, we are called to worship our great God and Savior. Hear these words from the psalmist. Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His loving kindness is everlasting. Who can speak of the mighty deeds of the Lord, or can show forth all His praise? How blessed are those who keep justice, who practice righteousness at all times.
Our Lord is worthy, and we give him ourselves to him in full surrender. From Psalm 104 and verses 33 and 34, the psalmist writes, I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. Let my meditation be pleasing to him. As for me, I shall be glad in the Lord. to stand firm. We are to stand firm in the face of whatever may come at us in this world because the one that we have entrusted ourselves to is in control of our lives. He is in control of all things and he is sustaining us and guiding us and moving us forward through this world. No matter what we might have to deal with in this life, Loss, grief, sadness, despair. He will continue to sustain us. He will continue to grow us and develop us, not just as individual believers, but he will grow us one to another in the body of Christ. God has been working in our lives all these years. He has been working in our lives, even in these recent months, to strengthen us as a church. To empower us to accomplish His purposes. To reach this world for His Son, Jesus Christ. And so we continue to look to Him and praise Him for the fact that God has wasted nothing. 
He has been with us every step of the way, and he will continue to be with us in the days ahead. Will you pray with me? Father God, we come before you and we admit as frail sinners that in times of trials, in times of discouragement and despair, that we are prone to sometimes losing our way, to having doubts, struggling in our faith. But Father, in your grace, you continue to remind us in your word of all that you have promised to us. And Father, you are faithful to your promises. Father, we praise you this morning. We give thanks to you because in our weakness, you are the one that makes us strong. When we cannot move any further, Father, you are the one that picks us up. When we are wounded, you are the one that tends to us and cares for us. And Father, we are a people in this world who deal with wounded hearts, who deal with pain, frustrations, bitterness, fear. But Father, we come to you and we release these over to you and ask that you would continue to make us whole. Continue to heal those past hurts that maybe we haven't dealt with in our lives. Help us to continue to see ourselves as you see us so that we do not have to compare ourselves to others. That we would see ourselves and one another as you see us. And Father, your word teaches us that we are your bride. We are righteous in your sight because of your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we praise you for that today. Thank you for seeing us as we really are. And thank you for seeing us as we are in Jesus Christ. Father, continue to teach us from your word. Continue to strengthen us in these days so that we can be a testimony to the world around us, not only of your grace, but also of your power. And Father, we look forward to the day when you will take away all pain, all suffering, and you will bring us into your presence for eternity. We look forward to that day. We trust you with our lives into that day. So continue to be with us this day. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. I am going to invite you at this time, uh, as we get into God's Word today, uh, to turn in your Bibles to uh, the letter of 1 Peter, chapter 5. Uh, this morning, we are going to wrap up our time uh, in 1 Peter, uh, which we started working through, uh, going all the way back to the first part of January. And as we come to the close of this first letter of Peter today, we are going to see the apostle uh, basically summarize what he had been encouraging uh, uh, the believers in Asia Minor to do back in the first century, namely to stand firm in their faith in the midst of their suffering, to stand firm in the faith in the midst of their suffering. You know, if you can recall uh, uh, what we talked about when we first started going through 1 Peter back in January, uh, I mentioned at the time that the suffering that uh, the believers there in Asia Minor were experiencing, well, it wasn't a, a, a severe uh, persecution as we might find in parts of our world today. Uh, the believers there weren't being tortured. Uh, they weren't being murdered for their beliefs, nor were they facing uh, universal state-sponsored persecution of Christians, although that would come in just a few more years. Instead, the believers there in Asia Minor at the time, well, they were being ostracized because of their beliefs. They were being ridiculed. They were being discriminated against simply because they identified themselves as Christ followers. And the suffering that we will likely face 
uh, in, in our culture today is similar to the persecution that those believers in Asia Minor faced. Instead of the severe persecution that other believers uh, face elsewhere in the world at this time. But wherever one falls on the spectrum of righteous suffering, whether you are uh, uh, in danger of maybe being thrown into jail or losing your life on the one end, or suffering ridicule, shame, mocking from people on the other end, wherever we fall on that spectrum of suffering for our faith, Peter's words serve as an encouragement to all believers. His words encourage us to endure through any suffering that we might face in hope and with faith. In today's verses, Peter is going to remind us of the grace of God, which enables us to stand firm, to faithfully endure whatever comes our way as believers. We're going to pick up in 1 Peter chapter 5, and we're going to be reading all the way to the end of this letter this morning, but I want to begin by looking at verses 6 through 11 in your Bibles. Beginning in verse 6. Peter says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. We don't necessarily see it in the English language, but if you were to look at the Greek here, what, what Peter does here is he structures his argument uh, in a specific pattern here, where he places an emphasis on verses 6 and on verse 10 to stress the point that he is getting across. And the main point that he wants to communicate here in these verses is that the road marked with Christian suffering is the same road that leads to glory and to exaltation. We've talked about this before in 1 Peter, and he's mentioned this previously in his letter. This emphasis that the road to glory for the, for the Christian, for the believer in Christ, is a road marked with suffering. All believers whether living in Asia Minor in the first century or living today, can rest assured that we can endure the suffering that God has willed for us because one day God will also exalt us. He will, as it says here in verse 10, he will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish us. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, which we looked at last week, Peter called the church to clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Clothe yourselves with humility. Well, in verse 6, Peter urges Christians now to humble ourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you. We are to embrace the suffering that God wills for us because we know that God also wills our exaltation. Notice Peter's call here for us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. Do you have a safe place in your life? 
Perhaps it's a designated location in your home where you might go in the event of a tornado or a break-in. Or perhaps it's a place you retreat to for rest and refreshment, whether it's in your home or some place that you travel to. I know that in the face of this pandemic, many have seen their homes as a place of safety from all the uncertainty going on in the world around us at this time. I also know that many believers are getting a little tired of being in their homes as well. For me, for a long time, and even till today, my safe place has been a state, a, a geographical state. For a long time, and, and up until now, uh, it's been Texas for me. I was in an environment there where I had a supporting, encouraging church family around me while I was in seminary. I was cared for, I was loved on, I was mentored. So much so that over time, Texas became this safe haven for me in times of turbulence in my life and in my ministry. Early on in ministry, after Debbie and I left the mission field, and as we were seeking God's guidance and direction in our lives at that time, Texas is a place I returned to in order to be cared for, in order to be confirmed, strengthened, and to reestablish a firm foundation in my life. And in seasons of strife and ministry, it's been a place that I have uh, gone back to and visit in, in short bursts to be encouraged, to get my bearings in life and in ministry. It's not a place I've seen myself serving in or ministering in, but it's a place where I feel like I can go to be ministered to and to be loved on. And so in my mind, Texas has become a place for me synonymous with safety, encouragement, refreshment. Well, when Peter tells us to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, he is telling us that there is no safer place to be in this world than under God's protective care. We can humbly embrace the suffering that comes from God's hand because we stand under the protection of that same mighty hand. The God who delivered Israel out of Egypt and the God who delivered Jesus from the grave is the same God who is able to deliver us through our suffering. And when Christ returns at the proper time, being under God's protective mighty hand, well, that will be the only safe place to be. So what does it mean to humble ourselves under God's mighty hand? It means that we live dependent lives upon his grace and mercy. It means, as it says here in verse 7, that we cast all of our anxieties on him. When we face suffering, it is easy to be afraid. We may worry about our family, our job, our social standing, or even about our own health and life. But before we allow these fears to overwhelm us, we are to remind ourselves of God's loving care for us and then in turn, turn over all these concerns to him. To humble ourselves under God's mighty hand means that we entrust our lives to God. We entrust ourselves to our heavenly father who loves and cares for us, his children. So when life gets hard, Simply because we are publicly living out our faith in Jesus Christ, simply because we are adhering to our biblical beliefs, well, we are to depend upon God, knowing that he is faithful and that he will guide us and protect us by his mighty hand as we face whatever may come. 
in seasons of suffering. We can also trust that God will fulfill his promises of future blessing. That he will indeed see to it that we receive our imperishable inheritance. This is what Peter is alluding to in verse 10, where he says, And after, after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Here, Peter is putting our suffering here on this earth in perspective. Compared to the eternal glory to which we have been called by the God of all grace, our present suffering is only for a little while. Our suffering will fade. Our future inheritance will not. We can endure for a little while because he will sustain us and lead us through our suffering to our eternal glory. He will strengthen us. He will fortify us so that we will endure to the end. Knowing this, trusting in this, helps us to see that verse 10 is essentially a promise of vindication for the believer. A promise of victory for us. And remember that Peter's words here were to a community of believers. How they responded collectively to suffering would be a central part of their testimony to the unbelieving world around them. A testimony of their faith in Jesus Christ, of their trust in him. And likewise, how we respond to suffering as a church is a part of our testimony to the world around us as well. We are called to endure suffering as a church in order to display God's gracious rule to the world around us. We entrust ourselves to God living under his mighty hand. And when we do so, we show the world the care that our king has for us and the joy that we have because of him. I want you to invite you to look at verses 8 and 9 now in your Bibles. As we patiently await our future glorification or our exaltation, as we patiently endure suffering, even if only for a little while, Peter encourages us once again to do so sober-mindedly. Peter gave believers a similar encouragement back in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7. To be sober-minded means to be clear-headed. This time, though, he also adds that we are to be watchful. We are to be clear-headed, and we are to be watchful or alert because, as Peter says here, our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking to devour. Ever since the Garden of Eden, the devil has been seeking to devour God's people. And so we must be sober and watchful because the devil is real. And if we are not careful, we can allow him to devour us. When it comes to the devil, I find that many Christians tend to gravitate towards two unhealthy extremes. They are either overly obsessed with the devil in things pertaining to the demonic realm or they are too dismissive. Well, the proper response of the Christian towards the devil is to be somewhere in the middle of those two extremes. Yes, the devil is a real foe, and we must be on guard for his attacks, but at the same time, we must remember that our Lord has already defeated him. So the one that is in us is greater than the one who prowls around us. The devil is a real threat, but he is also a limited threat. 
Despite all of his wily tactics, the devil can only do what God allows him to do. And most importantly, as Peter says here in verse 9, God has granted believers the grace to resist the devil. We are constantly to be on the lookout for the devil so that we can resist him time and time again. And we resist the devil and his deceptive tactics when we remain steadfast in our trust of God. When we suffer, the devil may tempt us to believe that God no longer cares for us or that he has abandoned us. But when we struggle, when we suffer, we are to remain steadfast in our faith, remaining under God's mighty hand and constantly reminding ourselves of God's gracious care. When we suffer, the devil may also tempt us to think that life is better for everyone else and that if we would only abandon Christ or compromise our scriptural beliefs, well, our suffering would be relieved. But we are to remain steadfast in our faith, knowing that our suffering is not unique. Christians everywhere and throughout history have suffered for their faith. But God continues to be at work in our suffering, strengthening our faith, strengthening the church, growing us in Christ-like character as we move toward our eternal inheritance. Peter would bring his letter to these believers in Asia Minor to a close in verses 12 and 14. As he gives one more encouragement to the believers to stand firm in the grace of God. It says here, by Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Peter implored the believers there in Asia Minor to stand firm in the true grace of God. What is the true grace of God according to Peter? Well, it's as we've talked about. It is the promise that God will see us through whatever suffering that we face by his grace to receive our eternal inheritance in due time. It is the promise that our glorification will come through our present suffering. It is the guarantee of our future inheritance. God, by his grace, will see us through to that day when we receive that inheritance. This is the key truth that Peter wanted to get across to the believers this is why he sent this letter with this faithful brother, Silvanus, to them. Peter wanted to communicate to all believers that we are to stand firm in God's grace. And that as we stand firm, we do not stand alone. This is why he says what he does in verse 13. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, and so does Mark, my son. Almost all biblical scholars agree that when Peter spoke of Babylon here, that he was referring to Rome. He brought up Babylon because he wanted believers to recall Israel's time of exile in that pagan land. If you will recall in the fall, we went through the first half of the book of Daniel, and we looked at how the Israelites who were in captivity there in Babylon, in that pagan land, how they lived, how they thrived. Well, in the New Testament, 
Babylon came to basically represent all people in the world who would stand opposed to God. So she who is at Babylon is a reference to the church in Rome who is facing increased opposition from the Roman authorities there. And what Peter was doing here was he was joining the chosen, persecuted followers in Asia Minor in the land of their exile with those persecuted Christ followers in exile in Rome. And going back farther, he was connecting those believers in Asia Minor with God's chosen people, the Israelites, who were once exiled in Babylon. In other words, Peter was telling believers that their suffering was nothing new. It's what other believers were experiencing elsewhere in the Roman Empire at the exact same time. And it's what all of God's people have experienced on some level because of their belief in the one true God throughout history. This reference to the church in Rome, along with the greeting from Mark here, were meant to remind Peter's readers that both churches and individual Christians stood with them in their suffering. They stood with them because they were enduring it as well. As we've gone through 1 Peter, I have encouraged us as a congregation to be thinking about how we can live on mission as a church. One of the first things that we need to understand is that in order for us to be a missional community, in order for us to live on mission, we need to care less about what our world and the community around us thinks about us. We need to boldly proclaim the gospel and to live out our faith, knowing that, yes, persecution and suffering will come as a result. And because of that, I believe that these words that Peter used to encourage the believers to do just that back in Asia Minor, well, I believe he would say the same thing today if he were here with us. Peter would encourage us to stand firm in the true grace of God as we suffer for our faith. He would encourage us to stand firm knowing that while much may be taken from us because of our faith, what cannot be taken away from us is our identity in Christ and our future inheritance. Peter would tell us to stand firm knowing that even though the world may kill us, we have already been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter would tell us to stand firm knowing that God does not waste our suffering. No, God is using our suffering to strengthen us and to deepen our faith. He would tell us to stand firm knowing that Jesus Christ himself traveled this road of righteous suffering. And he has blazed a path ahead of us, which we can follow. Peter would tell us to stand firm knowing that our Christian suffering is an indication that we truly belong to Jesus. And he would tell us to stand firm by humbling ourselves under God's mighty hand. So let us live out our faith without fear or hesitation. Let us publicly proclaim with our lips and display with our lives the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing that when we do, we will face suffering. But in the face of that suffering, let us stand firm in God's grace and continue to display God's love to one another, as well as to the watching world around us. I've mentioned this a few times as we've gone through 1 Peter. There is an alarming trend in the church in the West, particularly here in America, where I see an avoidance to adhere to biblical beliefs and commands out of fear of what the culture or the world might think of us. 
what the communities around us might think of us, what our neighbors, coworkers might think of us. And so because we operate as if we shouldn't suffer or we should be able to live out our faith uh, without suffering, we tend not to live out or publicly display and speak to our faith. We hold our biblical beliefs close to the chest, but we talk in a way that, well, we try to plan and do things as if we can avoid any type of suffering by not verbally proclaiming what we believe. Recently, I was watching one of my favorite movies from my childhood, and I'm not saying it's the most appropriate movie to watch, but it is one that I always enjoyed growing up. And in part of my effort to educate my wife on some of the great movies of the 80s, uh, we watched this together on TV. Uh, My wife hasn't seen a lot of the movies that I grew up watching uh, that I consider classics, like uh, Top Gun or The Karate Kid. Well, another one of my favorites from my childhood was the movie Beverly Hills Cop. And just the other night, we were watching it on TV. And we jumped into it a a little late, but it reminded me of the beginning of the movie. And they're uh, showing scenes around the city of Detroit to the song, The Heat Is On. And as I was thinking about that song and the lyrics to that song, I thought about the church in our world today. The heat is on. What will the church, what will we do in response when the heat is on us? What Peter has shown us is that if we aren't experiencing that heat from the community, the culture around us, then it's likely that we aren't living out our faith the way that Christ intends that we do. But what will we do when the heat is on? What will we do when our culture speaks out against us because of our beliefs? Will we seek to hide away? Will we pull in the ranks and come closer together and be more judicious about what we stand for and stand against? Or will we continue to endure as those believers in Asia Minor were doing back in the first century. Will we not change a thing about what we do and about what we proclaim and continue to stand firm in the knowledge that our mission is to bring glory to God by speaking of his son, Jesus Christ, to the world around us and for standing up for what we believe? What will we do when the heat is on us? Will we endure? Will we realize that that suffering is temporary? It is only for a little while in this world? Or will we panic? Will we grow fearful? And will we compromise what we believe? Peter calls us to stand firm, to push forward, to endure suffering, because God is with us. God is taking care of us, and God will see us through whatever we might face. So church family, stand firm in the faith. Trust our God. Look to him in times of suffering, and he will guide us every step of the way. Will you pray with me? Father God, I thank you for the encouragement of your word that when we suffer because of our beliefs, it's not because we have done something wrong. It's not because we've communicated the wrong thing. It's because that will always be the response when this world comes face to face with the truth of your holy word, when the world is presented with your son, Jesus Christ. Father, help us to be rooted in your word. Help us to take these words that you have given to us to encourage us to continue to live on mission, to be bold in our faith, to be a community that is set apart in our community 
And Father, I pray for this community of Ann Arbor. Father, I pray for those who are so far from the truth of the gospel, for those who stand resistant to the gospel, that you would continue to break those hearts down, that you would humble these people before you in this world before they humble themselves before you in the next, before it's too late. Father, use us to be a faithful public witness here. And Father, I thank you for those churches in our community that are continuing to live boldly for you, that are continuing to boldly proclaim the gospel. And Father, I know that there are those churches in our community that have faced and received backlash because of their beliefs. Father, as Peter encourages us in this letter, there are those throughout history that have suffered right alongside us. May we stand with our brothers and sisters in Christ who suffer in our communities because they proclaim and live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Father, may you give us the privilege of doing so in the days ahead as well. Continue to be with us. Continue to help us to turn over our anxieties and fears to you. Continue to help us to entrust you with our lives. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. That does conclude our time in the letter of 1 Peter. And as we move toward the coming months, we are going to focus on healthy relationships within the church. Because one of the things that we see from 1 Peter is that in order to be a missional community, we must be a community. And so we are going to take time in the coming months to look at some things that feed into being a healthy community, a healthy body of believers. We will look at some barriers to healthy community within the church but also some principles that can help guide us to developing that, that strong sense of intimacy, office, authenticity, and honesty within a community that needs to take place before we can really be a community that stands apart in our world. And so we look forward to uh, going through that this summer, and I know that at some point uh, we will be back together here at the church as we work through that uh, but whether uh, that's this coming week or, or next week or in the weeks following, uh, we'll begin this journey through this topic uh, of forming a, a healthy community uh, within our church starting next week, and we hope that you'll join us. We trust that God is continuing to guide you and speak to you in these days, and we hope that he is continuing to encourage you through his word, through fellow believers, and through this church. God bless. Take care.